Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Badenmayer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. This broadcast is part, part of our People's Summit with Regeneration International, broadcasting live today at the moment for the People's Food Summit. And you'll be able to find that at the Regeneration International Facebook page and all of our other social media channels. So I have the great pleasure this morning of getting to talk to Lynn Pledger and Rid Shin. They are the authors of Grass-Fed Beef for a Post-Pandemic World. And am I your first interview? Because this book doesn't come out until November. Yes. Oh, wow, that's so <laughs> exciting. OK, so excellent. And um, from the start, let's have you guys tell us where we can get this book, because everybody will want to go back to the beginning of the recording and say, wait, how do I get this book? Who's, who's your publisher? And where, where can you find the book now? Chelsea Green Publishing uh, in Vermont is our publisher, and um, the book can be pre-ordered uh, today or any time um, from any place that sells books. Uh, and uh, if you go to the Chelsea Green website, uh, you, you can order it from there. Awesome. Yeah, we love Chelsea Green. Excellent. All right. So you all have very interesting bios. I don't always read bios because it seems like, you know, we can bring this out in conversation, but I want to read your bios because I think there are some things that won't come up as we talk. So Ridge, you're the founding CEO of Grazer LLC. And most people know that as Big Picture Beef, a 100% grass-fed beef company partnering with farmers throughout the Northeastern United States. Early in your career, you became interested in heritage breeds of livestock and you co-founded the group now known as the Livestock Conservancy. You were also the founding director of the New England Livestock Alliance, and that helps farmers find markets for their meat. In addition to managing your own Devon herd in central Massachusetts, you've consulted all over North America, New Zealand, England, Uruguay, Argentina, and for the Lakota of the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. And your work has been recognized in Smithsonian, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Time Magazine, and they've dubbed you the Carbon Cowboy. And Lynn Pletcher, you're a writer, an environmental advocate. You've worked on public policy issues, including waste reduction, climate change, and energy. You've worked with Clean Water Action, Sierra Club, Upstream, and you've been a guest lecturer on sustainability topics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, Smith College, Lesley University, and Harvard School of Public Health. You've worked for decades with Ridge to preserve heritage livestock breeds and increase regenerative grazing in the Northeast United States. And you homeschooled your two kids and a grandchild. I'm so impressed. And you now live in Western Massachusetts and you're an awesome writer and you're writing a book of poetry. So um, I do wanna also mention as a, as a big thank you to you both, how I met you. Um, there were some, the USDA was doing its, I think it's every five years, they review what Americans should be eating and make recommendations. And then their recommendations are open for public comment. So in recent years, the, the word coming from USDA is that everybody needs to eat less meat. It's not good for you. It's going to give you cancer. And, wow. and that's period. They don't talk about different ways that meat is raised. They don't talk about the health benefits of grass-fed beef versus like nitrate-filled lunch meats that are super processed. So that's how we met. You two wrote and circulated a, a fantastic letter that was uh, signed on by tons of farmers, livestock producers all over the country and submitted those comments to the USDA. So let's start there because I think this is one of the hot topics. And it's a hot topic for me, certainly, because I was a vegetarian. I think I was still a vegetarian. I think it was like around 2015 that you guys wrote this letter and I promoted it and loved it so much. But I was still a vegetarian because I'd been brainwashed early on thinking that we we can't feed the world and without, you know, we can't feed the world with the way we're currently farming livestock. It's just way too destructive. And some pieces of that are true, but recently, I've learned from you and other folks about how nutritious well-raised meat can be. And I ended up changing my diet around 2020. Um, so I'm just one person who tells that story, but I think that's that's kind of something that's coming into fashion now is being a, 
a former vegetarian and a new regenerative organic livestock eater. So why why should people make this switch if if they're thinking about the environment? Well, we love the fact that you have switched. I love my 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 biggest joys when I'm doing a tasting is to convert vegetarians because <laughs> so many of them come from a, a good place. You know, I mean I embraced many years ago diet for a small planet, you know, and don't, you know, we should be eating the grain, not feeding it to the animals. Well, of course, that's perfectly true. But the cows can actually just eat grass and make their living. They don't need to eat grain. And it, it's it's a huge difference, but it's so hard for people to get their heads around it because of this prejudice that the cow's the problem. And the exciting thing is the cow's the solution. And um, But for most people, they just look at you and shake their head and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> but we firmly believe it, and we think the book lays out that proposition. So. Well, I, I'd like to offer a slightly different uh, take on that in that um, I think of the book as not so much about the individual dietary choices. It's not really about whether people should be vegetarians or not. Um, we feel that um, vegetarians can embrace regenerative grazing of, of cattle um, <clears throat> because it's a, a really a critically important strategy for the environment and particularly for the climate, our most urgent uh, environmental crisis. So we do uh, offer a, a very um, full chapter on the nu nutrition issues with uh, both both meat versus vegetarianism, but especially uh, grass-fed versus grain-fed. But um, having said that, the thrust of the book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, although it covers a lot of things, it covers animal welfare, it covers uh, um, agricultural uh, injustice and I inequality. But I think the main thrust is the environmental thrust. Yeah, there's a huge environmental case to be made. But while we're still talking about what people do eat or should eat, you also have a chapter in your book on fake meat. So why, if we're thinking fake meat versus real meat, what's the case for real meat? Well, <laughs> go ahead, Lynn. Uh, I think that um, if you look at the arguments for the fake meat, um, they are essentially our arguments for grass-fed as opposed to grain-fed. And, but they, they um, choose in the pr promotion of the fake, fake meat to ignore that all their concerns about the environment are addressed by grass-fed meat. And um, that, uh, not only that, I think it's really important to say it's not just all the po pollution uh, we're preventing by raising beef on pasture alone, and not just the um, you know um, uh, in those negatives, but there's all these positives. It, uh, while we're combating climate change, we're also restoring farmland. We're also protecting against droughts and floods. And um, and providing really uh, excellent protein for uh, needy world populations, and the pop world populations are getting more and more needy as weeks go by. And climate change is going to be um, really um, uh, traumatic in terms of uh, food that can no longer be grown where it's been grown for centuries. So it makes it doubly. Um, or triply more important, not to be feeding our grains to livestock. And also, uh, I just want to get in here one little known fact about the, the uh, regenerative grazing in that it uh, it makes the, the um, soil far more productive. Um, uh, we say anywhere, it, well, it's been documented 300% more productive in terms of you know, uh, biomass that it that can be generated from a piece of land. So we can grow by by integrating livestock into cropping systems. We can grow a lot more food uh, for a hungry world. Yeah, one of our one of our challenges as humans is that we think we can fix everything, 
and this propensity to do it in a lab or a factory or you know cellular meat it just is insane that we think we can improve on nature and you know it's uh, those are the things that are getting the funding those are the things that are exciting all the big four meat companies have plant-based uh meat operations but they're beginning to close them interestingly tyson just built a big plant for plant-based meats and they just closed it because it was an exciting thing for a while but you know at the end of the day what's remarkable is that we have this technology that is time tested and it's simple it's called photosynthesis and it works you just have to get with it instead of fight it. And it is, as Lynn says, that the results are just stunning once you begin to understand that. And it's not a no-brainer. And most people don't think it's as sexy as, you know, something grown in a lab. But it's remarkably sexy <laughs> when you get it going. But what's interesting is we need a lot of people to get trained and to understand how to do it. It's not it's not rocket science, but it's not a no-brainer. So it, but it's I feel it's a very exciting time because if the consumer can embrace this and understand, get some understanding of it, and go and demand the product from their vendor, all of a sudden, you know, it will it's gonna create this demand, which is uh will do all these things. It'll stop the flooding. It'll store carbon. It'll create, you know, a rural economy that's vibrant again and on and on. So those are the possibility. But it's it, telling the story is, you know, that's one of the reasons we're so tickled to have this book coming out is because it, it does kind of <clears throat> present the argument in a very cogent way so that people with a half an interest can say, oh, my God, <laughs> look at this. I can't resist pointing out that grass-fed beef is plant-based. Yeah. And that's one of the uh, it, things that excites me that we cover in the book is that it has been determined, in fact, that the um, phytonutrients from the pasture plants, the grasses and all the different forage plants, uh, all those beneficial nutrients are concentrated in, in meat and milk of, of grass-fed animals, um, you know, uh, two or three times more um, riboflavin, for example. Um, right. And uh, so it's particularly interesting because there's about 200,000 um, plant species on earth and um, our, the total crop, you know, uh, 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 considering the world's crops, 80% of them are the same dozen, dozen plants. <laughs> and so here we have this, uh, a, a world full of, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, sources of nutrition and, you know, be beneficial uh, nutrients that we could be tapping into, but we're kind of stuck in this, um, you know, uh, of course, we're, we're, as humans, we're limited to, um, we can't digest cellulose, but we know who can, <laughs> ruminant animals, cat, cattle can uh, make use of uh, all these wonderful plants. And, and uh, one of our sidebars in the book, we point out how cattle are very discriminating about what they eat. They're not just plodding along and eating whatever's in front of them. Um, they have that instinctual ability, of what, what they need. And um, cattle in a, a, a pasture with the diversity of plants um, can provide for themselves both uh, on a daily basis and in a a situation where they're, you know, need to be self-doctoring themselves with with food, so um, so we have healthier meat, and we can benefit. We can benefit uh, from this plant-based food uh, by eating grass-fed beef. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I I think that's true because what they're calling plant-based is is often cell cultures, um, genetically modified microbes belching out proteins you know it's it's not i i think you're right that that grass-fed beef is actually more plant-based than a lot of the lab creations that they're they're marketing as plant-based 
Well, maybe we need a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually heard a comedian talking about this recently, just locally. Like his joke was that it actually cows create plant-based meat much better. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll get, get some currency. So, um, you know, this is such a wonderful opportunity and anybody who's watching live on Rockfin, please take advantage because people pay a lot of money, I'm sure, to, uh, to get your consultation going into a grass-fed operation. And that's one of the things that I found most exciting about your book is it really is a, a primer, a great 101 for anybody who is considering grass-fed livestock farming. And the way you pitch it is very compelling. You're, you're making the case that you don't need a huge economic investment. Um, yeah, why don't you start there? Like, why, why would you, if somebody said, I want to go into farming, but I'm not a legacy farmer, I don't have land, I don't have a whole lot of money, um, why would you suggest grass-fed beef as an entry point to farming? Go ahead, Rich. This is your <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, um, it's so simple. There's um, cattle eat grass automatically. They just do it. Um, so um, you can, there's so many ways to come at it. And there's, uh, if you don't have, you know, uh, a thousand acre farm and this and that. So there's, there's so many ways that you can. It's kind of like my experience when I leased land from the local land trust, leased land from neighbors who have a lot of land but don't want it to grow up into brush and trees. One of the things we have in, North, in the Northeast is if you leave a, land, a piece of land fallow for any period of time, it'll go to goldenrod and sassafras and then it becomes trees. Right. It's just uh, on its own. But if you apply the cattle, the cattle will graze back to the snow walls. They'll create that vista that we all love of open grassland. <clears throat> but it's not, you know, a person with a piece of land can't really do that. But if you are able to get some cattle, either by hook or by crook, you know, borrow them or, you know, custom graze them for somebody else. And you can begin this process and... Uh, Little by little, you can have um, a set of cattle. And if you pick the right kind of cattle, um, you can be very successful on grass. And, and you know, at the end of the day, grass-fed beef is the low cost of production. You know, for years, when I would be going into the markets in New York City trying to find out what product was in there, and there was always grass-fed lamb from New Zealand. And I'm <laughs> like, how in the heck... Can grass-fed lamb fly from New Zealand to New York City? Well, it can because it's the low cost of production. And we have the problem mm -hmm. here. I have the problem many times when people say, well, I go to the grocery store and the grain-fed beef is cheaper than the grass-fed beef. And I've, I said, yes, because of the government subsidy. The government pays money to the corn farmer which they don't really want to do that, but they, they take the subsidy and they grow corn and soy, and then it goes to feed the cattle. And it becomes a, you know, economically it's cheaper, but that's without measuring any of the, you know, ecosystem <clears throat> impacts that are created by the whole system. But at the end of the day, feeding a ruminant grass is, is the low cost of production. And, and like I said, it's, it's um, the cattle know how to do this. You know, many times it's fascinating to me. Like I, I, I was trying to sell some meat to a, a co-op up in New Hampshire and the, the um, administrators were interested, but the butchers were like, grass-fed beef. Rah, rah, rah. Huh. <laughs> so I said, well, bring them down, you know, put them in a van, bring them down to the farm. So they came down, and it was like six or eight of them, and they got out of the van. They were grumpy in spite of being on a day off, you know. <laughs> but by the end of the day, I couldn't get rid of them because they were like, oh, my God, look at this. And, and you know, I took them over to show them the cattle that were in a paddock, and I had an adjacent paddock ready for them to go into the graves. And as I opened the wire, the cattle started all getting up, and they're all like, what's going on? And I said, well... They know how to do this. <laughs> They've done it every day for their lives. 
And they know that there's new food over there. So they're going to go in. But then as you stand back and watch, they go around the paddock and they harvest all of the tops of the plants first. And then they go and do the next. So the bovine has a long history of knowing how to do this. What messes it up is the human who says, now you got to stay there and eat until there's nothing left to eat. Or right. you're down to roots and dirt. But... Um, <clears throat> So that so the bovine knows how to do it, and if you're at all observant and interested, um, you know you could do it without a lot of resources. You need, and that's the thing that's exciting for for doing grass-fed beef. You really, you know, you have to have a fence that keeps them off a road. But beyond that, a single electric wire is how we manage it. And people say, well, how do you keep them in just one single wire? I said, well. They're never hungry. You know, there's no pressure on that wire. The wire only says eat here today and tomorrow we'll let you eat here. But there's no, it's not like there's nothing to eat. And that the pressure on that fence is immense. You'll never hold them in if they have nothing to eat. And that's how a lot of grass-fed cattle are managed, actually. But it is, it's very exciting uh, possibility for people to jump in with not much for resources. To add to that, uh, another resource they don't need is a barn. Uh, they don't oh, even need a tractor uh, because it's uh, the need for the tractor is pretty limited, and you can rent one or you know make an arrangement with your neighbor or whatever. So it's between the the not needing a, a vast acreage or um, a barn and tractor, uh, that kind of elaborate fencing and so forth. It's it's not much infrastructure, um, and and what's exciting about that is that. Um, groups that haven't been able to participate in our food system as owners and operators, um, you know, have, have an opportunity with grass fed beef to get involved in something that's, you know, um, that they can, where they can make it economically. And it's also good work in the world to do, uh, you know, for the environment and um, to just, to just, Kind of segue into that that the other thing that i'm excited about in terms of opportunities for people who haven't been involved in agriculture but would like to be but have uh, come up against obstacles is that um uh this uh grass-fed beef uh, really opens up a new agrarian niche of of finishing to skill and uh you know uh uh, as Ridge was talking about the cattle, the cattle know how, how to, to eat. And of course, that's what you're working with their inst instinctive knowledge. But um, uh, we don't want to imply that anybody can just turn cattle loose and they'll be succeed because it's, um, you, you do have to know the basics of, 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 man, of this rotation because that's key to what makes it uh, regenerative. Is that you do have to know, you know, when when to move the cattle, and, um, and and especially for the finishing, that is that's where the real you know skill comes in. It's more demanding. Uh, the cattle need to be moved multiple times a day, whereas when you're raising the young stock, they might go a few days in the same piece. So that fits well with someone who has another job, and is mm -hmm. cattle as well. Whereas the finishing is pretty much full-time job and uh again we want to stress there are resources out there in the in our book um we mention um sarah flack's book the art and science of grazing so mm -hmm. give a shout out to sarah for do that wonderful job of people want to know okay how do i plan this how do i go about it day to day well that's that's a great resource for you we have some of that information we have the broad strokes in our book um but um there's to get into more depth for people who are thinking, you know, this is for me, maybe grazing or, you know, getting involved in that uh, angle. Uh, there are yeah. ways out there to learn. There's a lot to, a lot to be learned about how to do it. Um, and it's yeah. just based on current science um, of, of um, you know, the, the so soil science has advanced so much in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And so it's, it's really ironic that, we're still farmers, or most of them are still operating as though 
science hadn't learned anything since World War II. <laughs> Whereas, in fact, it's very exciting what science has learned. I always think of it starting, although this probably isn't true, but in, in the 1990s, Mm -hmm. Sarah Wright and Christine Nichols mm -hmm. identified glomalin or glomalin, depending on how you want to say it, um, uh, which is this key element in the soil that really um, is produced by the by the microbes, and that's what that's what makes all these wonderful claims uh, valid that we're making about combating climate change, storing carbon in the soil, and protecting. Mm -hmm. Droughts and floods and all those things. It's really glomalin, and um, and yet that was what I think something like 1996. And uh, here here we are, decades later, and the word isn't out that hey, there's something we've discovered about how to grow food and how to protect the environment um, that not nearly enough people are talking about. So we're we're so happy to have. I've written this book and to have this opportunity today to talk about it. Well, it's such an amazing resource. I learned so much. Um, you know, I've been reading on this topic for many years, but this book really um, includes is a is hitting all the angles and going in depth enough so that someone like me who's read a bunch of books on this topic really I learned quite a bit. Well, you um, know, I just yeah. want to say I'm glad you mentioned that because that that's kind of on purpose that we combined the big picture issues like you know world hunger and and rate and social inequities and things like that with um uh how some how to um and uh, because we we felt that it wasn't just for for farmers and ranchers we feel that consumers and you know, concerned, uh, um, concerned consumers, enlightened consumers, people interested in the environment and uh, and worried about climate change, they need to know that this is not some, you know, fringe theory. That this right. is is a science based methodology. It's been proven, and uh, you know, I think by including a, 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 a you know some how to uh, tips. Um, we're indicating to people like yourself who would be well informed and would need to know, okay, uh, you know, some people will say, okay, how? If you say it combats uh, climate change, how? So we have to, we, you know, we have to offer enough uh, scientific information and, and citations so that people realize, you know, this is pretty thoroughly understood and and uh, the you know bugs have been worked out uh, you know this is a shovel ready <laughs> yeah uh, approach it totally is yeah i just want to mention one thing i i thought was really cool in the book um you talk about the different soil tests and um, nutrient density tests for your pasture that you can use and it's very practical because what the farmer is trying to figure out is how how much production can this land support? How many cows can I put on this land? How how much feed will I have? Um, can you, you want to talk a little bit about that? It's just one sort of practical, neat thing. You mentioned three different tests that you think, um, you know, as a starter that farmers can use to to answer some of these questions when planning out their rotations and, and the amount of land and their stocking density. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, the um, you know the, the testing is the place to start, but the 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 solution is always apply the cattle. <laughs> you know, I, I took over uh, when I first leased the land trust. the The farm had been just leased out to a local farmer for the last thirty years, and they planted corn every year, and they used the worst possible chemicals you could imagine, and. Um, so I went in and <clears throat> decided, well, I've got to plow it up and I got to plant something. So I did that. And um, it didn't grow very well in the areas that you could see in the ends of the field where the spray rig had missed that the plants would grow fairly well. But we grazed it and it took a couple years. But what happened is that the plants began to create the penetration in the soil 
you know, we did a little field day where we took a penetrometer. That's a device you can just push into the ground and you can measure the kilograms of force it takes. And we were hitting this plow sole, this kind of se seared area about eight inches down all over the place. But then we went over near a chicory plant that we had planted and you could push that directly into the ground three feet deep. So the chicory physically was breaking through that plow sole and making permeability to get the uh, <clears throat> carbon down, to get the nutrients back up to the plants and that whole kind of thing. So within three years, it, um, you know, I had grass that was uh, four feet tall on that piece of land. And it dawned on me once when I was there taking a tour and I looked across at the fence at my neighbor's land, my neighbor's land, he'd been making hay for this whole time. He'd never, no cattle, he'd make hay. And he hadn't been able to mow the grass because um, it'd been wet. It was, and we were managing for the bobolinks. So we wanted to let the bobolinks grow up and fledge before we mowed or grazed. And I realized my grass was four feet tall and his was two feet tall. Huh. And my grass was so dense. We have a tool called a, a grass stick where you stick it, you know, you look at the height of the grass and then you slide it horizontally in the grass. The NRCS makes these and it's got a little grid on it with little dots. So you look down on the stick and count the number of dots and that tells you how much biomass per acre inch you have depending on the type of grass it's growing. So it's not totally scientific, but it's pretty scientific. Well, when I slid the stick into my grass, I couldn't see the stick, let alone the dot. <laughs> so I have grass that's four feet tall, so dense that I don't even get a reading on the density. So how many, how much biomass per acre inch? It's just phenomenal. And the research, you know, Richard Teague's the one we quote a lot, but he's the mm -hmm. one that's done a lot of the research on this <laughs> adaptive multi paddock grazing. And I was talking to him once about a lot of his funding actually came from McDonald's. And I said, well, geez, you got to put me in touch with McDonald's. And he said, well, you know, it's it's price, price, price. And I said, well, I understand, Richard, but if I can have three times as much grass, then, right. you know, there's the economics. And he said, you're wrong, Rich. And I said, what do you mean I'm wrong? He says, what we're finding is it's five to six times the biomass per acre. So it's just a stunning possibility to take a piece of land. You know, think of the piece of land, you're leasing it for whatever it is, $25 an acre, all of a sudden you have three to six times as much. Well, wow. So now you're leasing it for $4 an acre. I mean, it's just unbelievable. What you find is that, uh, you know, on the same piece of land, what Richard has, has told us is that, um, you know, you'll see uh, farm side by side and the, the regeneratively grazed farms are much more grass, they're much more productive, and yet they have many more animals because the fertility has been so, you know, so attended to, not by add-ons, not by adding things on. No, yeah, no inputs, just simply. And, you know, the thing is, um, I remember being interviewed by NPR when we had the bobolinks, and they were saying, well, don't you feel badly that you can't mow this hay? And I'm saying, actually, I don't because my grass is four feet tall. Therefore, my roots are at least four feet deep. So I, you know, I have a test that measures that. But the proxy of vibrant grasslands is indicative that you have a, you you've you've taken care of all the flora and fauna under the soil, and you've got them rocking and rolling. You're not spraying any poisons. You're not poisoning them with any chemical fertilizers, and you know the evidence is that. You know, you 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 know you you've actually healed that land, and the net result is you can support more animals, and the economics, and on and on. And it happens so rapidly. You know, this is the other thing that people say about you know building soil is going to take eons, mm. and the reality is it happens very quickly. Well, you Richard. Know, Richard says uh, a year or two, you'll see you'll see the response. But I, I want to make sure that we let people know 
what does create this fertility? Because we've said we're not talking about add-ons. So what creates it? Is it the manure from the animals? A lot of people think that's true. Well, and of course it is to some extent, it, the, the manure is important, but the real story is probably the most important thing we can say today is that it's the microorganisms in the soil. And the whole point of this, um, of our practices of, of moving the cattle in a rotation that allows the the land to regenerate that's already been grazed before it's regrazed. A lot of people call that rest. I don't like to call it rest because mm. there's so much activity going on that you can't see. It's just under the ground. Uh, you, you know, these um, the 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 microbes and and of course there's a lot of them involved. There's the whole whole food web involved, but um, really the the stars, if you will, the leaves are the mycorrhizal fungi and uh, and associated bacteria. And I think people will be interested to know about um, how this how feed this feedback works in a pasture or early in the season, how the how the grazing is actually related to mm -hmm. the fertility. It's the, it's the picture picture the the pasture, a cow taking a chomp of grass. When that happens, of course, the, the grass plant is partially defoliated. And so the plant sends a chemical signal down to the roots to release some of the car the uh, carbon that's stored there, the carbohydrates. You know, you everyone's familiar with photosynthesis from when we were school kids, right? We memorized that, that the carbon gets stored in the roots. Well, there it is. And the, so... This is kind of a a, um, a, a a simplified version of what happens, but as I say, the plant knows it's de ah, it's defoliated. I'm, I'm defoliated. I've got to regrow, so it sends the chemical signal down to the roots to release some of those sugary carbon carbohydrates down there uh, into the soil. When that happens, uh, that attracts microbes, and um, they the microbes come they feast on the the exudates from the roots they feast on each other i mean it's just this oh, swirl of life and and death of microbes but um what they're do what they set up and like here again here's where the mycorrhizae or the fungi i'll call them the fungi for short um but the ones that live in on and around the roots are called mycorrhizal fungi and they create they have can create filaments, these long filaments that can, you know, yards long. And they set up a, a two-way flow of um, nutrients and car or carbon. Basically, they're trading, to, you know, this is, of course, an anthropomorphic term, trading the carbon that they are getting from the plant roots, <laughs> excess carbon, for nutrients that the plant needs. And this is what uh, uh, scientist Christine Jones calls the bidirectional flow within <laughs> these filaments. And these filaments can go far beyond the reach of the plant roots to get, to get you know, not just nitrogen and, and uh, water and all kinds of, of, of elements that might be the the plant might need a particular trace element. There's nowhere near its roots, but they can get it through through these through this network of of hyphae from, that come from the from the the fungi. So um, this is the basis of, of nutrient cycling. Mm. Um, so some of that carbon is is eaten by the by the microbes, but but a great deal of it is stored in the soil and so the topsoil just increases and the amount of carbon increases and um year by year um and and uh dr teague says that in, in uh, one farm for example a ranch where he is working they've been working for for 15 years and measuring the, the carbon and um what he has found that as long as animals are kept on the land um that um, the carbon continues to increase and accumulate. And um, so 
even for those who say, oh, the carbon won't, you know, won't last forever, it's not permanent. Well, um, it's continually being replenished. And even if it weren't, um, uh, even if it weren't replenished, um, wouldn't we all be pretty happy if we if we could know for the next 25, 50 years, carbon was going to be increased, drawn out of the atmosphere and and stored in the soil? Um, that would at least give us some time to figure out how we're going to reduce carbon emissions. Yeah. So we desperately need to start. Um, well, the plants are pulling it out of the air, but we need to foster the microbes that are going to store it in the soil. And that's what regenerative grazing is all about. I, I started all this talking about this feedback mechanism when the plant is defoliated by the chomping of the cow. And that starts the release of the exudates. And then that starts this uh, very complicated um, uh, microbial activity. And that's what we want to foster. And they're the ones that are creating the fertility. Um, right. It's the biology that creates the fertility, not not going to the store and buying add-ons. You don't you don't right. eliminate all those the first year, but you'll uh, uh, you know maybe you cut that your fertilizer use in in you know a third the first year and then a half and then in a few years you've eliminated uh, a purchased fertilizer and you've gotten your biology working and uh, so so you're you're all set. So your profitability is directly related to your soil health. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my favorite case studies in your book is about a tobacco farm. It was like a hundred acres of, of land that had been grown with tobacco and was really depleted. And the method of regenerative grazing there was to plant cover crops. Um, can you tell us about that system because it's it's a little different you know if you've got grass if you've got pasture you can put right. cows on there and right. apparently like there's a latent seed bed and you're as as you continue to graze there in that land that land will develop a more diverse um grass buffet <laughs> um, but you can also plant cover crops and that's a way to to create if you're taking something that was like corn and soy or tobacco and creating grazing land, that's another different way to to jumpstart that. How does that process work? I thought that was a really cool case yeah, study. Yeah, that's that's um, that, that's the strategy really to go from some sort of cropland back to vibrant uh, polyculture. You know, and that was a farm I worked on as a consultant in uh, North Carolina, and we. You know, we, we were quite interested in all this grazing. And actually, one thing they had was a 2,000-acre cornfield that I was just, when I first oh. saw it, I was just salivating. I'm like, give me that really? field, you really? know? I, yeah. That, that doesn't look like a nightmare to you? Because to me, I'm No, thinking, no, I was so excited to say we, we could turn <laughs> this into vibrant grassland. Wow. And he, and he said, the, the owner said, well, you show me first. I said, okay, okay. So... We backed off onto one of the smaller farms where we had about 150 acres that had been in tobacco for years, like like a lot of land that's so-called burned out. You know, potato land in Maine, tobacco, and let, there's the cropping is just consistent year after year between the poisons and the glyphosate and everything. You've killed the biology. And um, so we 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 ran into a couple of people, Gabe Brown and that Ray Archuleta, Ray Archuleta, and they said, plant a cover crop. So we did the soil test. We sent off a Haney soil test, and then that specified a um, eight species cover crop. And, and this, what we're finding is, it works best with a with a cocktail, with a mix. So we planted that <coughs> cocktail cover crop on this essentially barren land, and it was remarkable. It grew, and we had about a hundred hundred head of cattle, and we we fed them on this cover crop. We we made little strips so that they could eat it, and then we gave them a new strip. And mm -hmm. I actually, you know, I have videos of it. That the cover crop was over the cattle's head, and you know they went into it, and you could hear them going, <laughs> just chomping all this stuff. And the remarks, you know, the results were stunning because the cattle gained weight. This is what's interesting on a, on a cocktail cover crop. 
grass-fed cattle can gain at a rate, a daily rate, equivalent to a feedlot. So one of the advantages wow. of a feedlot, you put the cattle in here and you make them stand still and you pour the energy in, the corn and the soy. And <clears throat> with a cover crop, they can gain up over three pounds a day, which is just remarkable wow. without any feedlot. But the results to the soil were what were stunning. You know, because the um, we just kind of shocked the microbial activity with between between the cattle, the activity of their feet, the nutrients, urine and, and manure, and um, trampling some of the organic matter that from the leftover cover crop. It was just like a it was so fast. It's just it's just remarkable. But it's a, an excellent strategy for taking a farm like a dairy farm that's been in corn for years and to shift it back to a perennial, you know, polyculture. <clears throat> so it is, it's a stunning, you know, technique to, to start uh, rather than just trying to plant a perennial and it's a much slower process, but the, the cover crop is very stimulating of uh, that whole process. And yeah, it's very exciting. And, you know, back to what Lynn was saying about the soil micro uh, and the carbon and storing the carbon and all that, the real exciting part of that is the water cycle. Mm. So, you know, when if you go actually on our website, there's a video, but there's a guy out west who took and did a perk test, essentially, on three adjacent fields. Rich, I'm going to interrupt you because you mentioned a guy out the Midwest. It's NRCS. It's the... the um... National Bowls, yeah. Service. So this is this is a government program and it's documented. Um, so right. But anyway, he so he basically he just took a piece of irrigation pipe and poured a quart of water in and measured how long it takes to percolate. And so on the corn land that he tried he tested was corn land that had been no-till seeded, the best modern practices for corn. And uh, he poured the water in, and it took 30 minutes to percolate. So do you, does anybody wonder why the Mississippi floods? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have whole states of corn and soy in the Mississippi River uh, watershed, and the water can't go in. It goes downhill. It's got to go somewhere. It goes. So, so then he moves over a test uh, scenario where it's extensively grazed the way it happens out West where the cattle just put out all summer on, you know, one piece of land. They're just turned out and they wander around They eat whatever they want. So. Um, They're not rotated in other words. Right. No, continuously grazed. Yeah. The wrong way. <laughs> right. So that was, uh, Dramatically better than the corn. Huh, okay. It was about Lynn will check me on the numbers, but that was seven minutes. Okay. Then he moves over to the adaptive multi paddock grazed the way we do it. And the perk was 10 seconds. So the difference between 10 seconds and 30 minutes. Wow. That's, it is a that's huge the, that's wow. For your, uh, the health of your soil, the structure um, is just, <clears throat> and that, that's because you have well aggregated soil with all these little uh, cr crumbs that have been formed again by the microbes, and they all have air spaces between them, and the, the water has a place to go and uh, be retained. And, uh, and 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 then it can be utilized as needed in in, in drought because floods and droughts are the just two sides of the same coin. It's yeah. the result of of you know poorly structured or lack of structure in soil. So that's one of the things this addresses. So you know this is why I, I get so frustrated with people arguing about how much carbon is going to be stored, how long is it going to last. Well, the storage storage of carbon is perhaps the most um, urgently needed um, uh, impact that we can have benefit. Mm -hmm. But what about resist? What about resilience in times of flood and drought? I mean, that's right. 
how important is that? And it's demonstrated. It's, there's no question about it. Nobody argues about this. It's just a fact. This is what the regenerative grazing does. And again, what you're doing by the grazing um, and grazing in the, in this way of, of, of letting the, the paddock remove the cattle when the grass is, when they've only eaten the tops, you know, less than half, then you move it and you let all this, um, uh, biology work in the soil and you don't return cattle to that until it's fully <laughs> regrown and you have the robust population of microbes and then you can graze it again. And I mean, in, in this, in this part of the country in new England, uh, you can, uh, you know, you could go back a few times in, in the, in the dry areas, uh, out West, you may, maybe once, you know, you, you would need more, land and uh you know you could that rotation would be maybe once a year so i uh, what i'm indicating here is that you you can do this anywhere and uh, we mentioned in the book in, in the chihuahuan desert um hmm. there's, there's now a green way of regenerative grazing in the chihuahuan desert which um with a lot of you know biological diversity and um uh, grassland birds and um, uh, you know it's not a miracle it's people adapting the strategies that that we outline in the book um, of this uh, utilizing what's in that fence to very easily move the cattle to a new bite of grass and then uh, you know people scoff at the idea that you can uh, you know reverse desertification and, but it's really true, and it's not achieved by a miracle. It's achieved by a very um, commonsensical way. You start, you put the cattle in the in the most fertile areas that you've got, and you you work gradually into the uh, the drier areas. And so so you're just moving in, and you're making that uh, you know. You, you're, you're working all around and eventually, eventually you don't have any more desert. Right. Yeah. And you can increase your stocking density. You start with low stocking density and then you increase as you increase the amount of feed that's coming from the land. It's very cool. It's, you've got so many cool case studies in the book. One thing we haven't talked about yet that you devote a lot of attention to in the book, and that's extremely important, is the processing of the beef. Um, cause you know, raw milk, that's sort of cool. That's, you don't require processing. A farmer can sell direct to consumers, but, but very few people can process their livestock on their farm. There are some people who have created models for this. Um, but essentially, you know, when we're thinking about a person who is going into farming now, looking for these low cost ways to, to enter farming, producing nutrient dense food, supporting their local economy, the the big roadblock, I mean, you've described how how the grazing system works perfectly. I mean, it requires some management, obviously, yeah. some planning, clearly, but it, it works pretty well. And I think the, the piece that isn't working very well for farmers is getting that livestock process. So, so um, yeah, take it from there, wherever you think the, the most important kernel of it, and then we'll go all the way to public policy from uh, the, 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 the processing thing is a real conundrum. Yeah. And we have a big history in this. So basically, in our business, we have tried all different varieties. And, and as much as small is beautiful and everybody loves the small plant, it, there are some challenges with it. Because disassembling an animal is a very skilled process. And it is, uh, it's hard to have enough people with the right skill level to do it efficiently in a small plant. And there's many, many inefficiencies in a small to medium sized plant that are not, <clears throat> you know, what, like one of them is uh, we all would love to have the animal use nose to tail, you know, all the parts. But when you get in a small plant, like a number of small plants we've worked with, they don't have a market for the oxtail and the liver and the heart. And they throw it in a dumpster and they make mm -hmm. me pay to throw it in a dumpster. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's outrageous. And you say, oh, my God, how can this be? Well, when you think about it, you know, if you if I'm harvesting five animals and I have five oxtails, how do I get that to market? You know, how do I get those five oxtails to market with any value left by the time I pay transport and that kind of thing? So it's really a conundrum. And, uh, you know, I've come to the position that, I, you know, I would like to piggyback on the larger producer because so many of the things they do are so much more efficient and the cost parameters are lower. And, um, you know, they have this, there's, there are some advantage is to to large um but um so so there's no easy answer there's lots of small plants that have been built attempting to solve all these problems but many of them struggle you know so yeah i i think one thing that's important to to note you know we've talked about the the, the challenge with with getting skilled people to work in the small plant in the sort of team approach to to breaking a carcass that we touch on, um, but but we we don't want to leave you with thinking that you have where where the skilled people are are in the large plants. They're not at all. Right. It's a, an assembly line, and you know that's that's the the amazing thing is you have people standing there all day and they're making the same cut, and none of them can do the whole job. They know how, you know they, they know how to do that. And so there's so much wrong with that picture that we can't do it all on this, on this, uh, you know, time period. But, um, you know, what, what we're thinking is that uh, you said you wanted to move gradually toward the big picture, the public policy picture. And of course, you know, that's an, uh, you know, that, that, that's been, they've been, um, Adding that idea around for a long time of breaking up these giant corporations, there's basically four, four multinational companies that, um, you know, they're operating all over the world and, you know, killing their plants, are killing thousands of animals a day. And they're controlling 85% of, of the meat. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that makes for a lot of problems, and and we witnessed that with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know the, the the name of our book is "Il Grasso Be for a Post Pandemic World." That's one of the things we've learned that um, right now there's that was a shock to our system, the pandemic. But look at all the shocks that we have to <coughs> to account: pandemics, uh, extreme weather events, terrorism war uh, uh ransomware attacks so it just does there's so many reasons why it does not make sense to have these gigantic um uh processing facilities that are are um owned and, uh, and operated by these you know by just a handful of, of corporations mm -hmm. and so you know uh i i think one thing that, that there's going to it, this is going to have to be a multi-pronged effort and yeah. there's the public policy issue there's whatever you can do on the you know the government side to you know to make uh, to break up some of these big uh, uh, you know monopolies but but also um people raising more people all over the country doing this regenerative grazing growing grass-fed beef um you know, it's just a lot, uh, the, 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 a lot easier to absorb shocks. You know, if you have, if you're, if you're depending on your, your beef coming up from a couple thousand miles away or even from overseas, that that's really, you're really in a vulnerable position. But if you're, um, if your meat, if the cattle were raised a couple hours from where you live and pr is processed in the same region where you live, um, you know, you've got, uh, and all this is happening all over the country. Then you have a lot of 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 um, you have a lot of farmers and ranchers who who need who need the processing service, um, yeah. who want to be rewarded for producing a quality product. Mm -hmm. They don't get pound, paid for pounds. They they would like to get a recognition for for the fact that they they've raised animals in a way that's 
you know, benefiting the environment, benefiting health and so forth. And they need processing. So, you know, there's there's the hope that I think I referred to it in the book as the, the, the perfect storm. Perhaps the perfect storm of, of, of conditions will arise where we have the people recognizing recognizing the need to get away from the fossil fuels and the 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 climate emissions associated with traditional beef production and um you know, the, the people want to get away from the need for imported fertilizer and so forth and as people realize gee regenerative grazing has a lot of these answers more people will be doing it under different climatic conditions geographic conditions and more um, smaller processors will be able to, you know, establish customer bases where they where they didn't have them before. Um, but it's it's a, it's it's a complex picture. Yeah, you know, well, one of the conundrums with the whole processing animals is what we refer to as balancing the carcass. Right. So, so most small to medium sized producers go and have the animals custom killed and then they get this all the boxes of the pieces. And most small companies struggle with the fact that they don't have a home for all the pieces. They got a lot of it sold, but there's still a bunch of this or a bunch of that or a mostly bunch of burger. This. what's that? I was just saying mostly burger, most of the carcasses. Right. And, and, and what you typically do is say, okay, I can't sell it right today, so I'll put it in the freezer. And then what happens is it loses value. And I mean, believe me, I have experience. <laughs> and what's hard is that the big companies, what they do is they add the packer balances the carcass. So in other words, they make, they make all the pieces go away and they have such a volume they have the advantage. I mean, they'll sell the pancreas gland. They'll sell all the oxtail. They'll sell the liver, the heart, the bones. All the pieces get sold, and um, it's very hard to do that on a on a, a small scale. So there's no straight line, easy answer. I guess is is the answer. But what is interesting to me is that the marketplace has embraced this product. If you read in the book, you know, pre-COVID, we were we had had this uh, <clears throat> agreement with Performance Food Group agreement. We we spent quite a bit of time pitching their salespeople, and we had all these customers drop in. You know, Gillette it's Stadium, customer. Gillette Stadium, you know, right. Brown University, Harvard, Harvard, Dartmouth, wow. all these people. You know, Cornell, they all wanted this product. And it was, we were like stunned and we were like, how are we going to produce all this product? But we liked the, that problem. And then we were, yeah, sure right. COVID. And, then, and then COVID hit and boom, it mm. stopped. It, it, it didn't slow down, it just stopped. And we are still working with that company and they're very actively want to try and get us going again. And in the interim, all those universities are still buying product of the grass fed. But it's like coming from New Zealand or Uruguay or Australia. But, the, it's, but it's all, we have to remember that prior to COVID, from from 2012, the grass-fed beef market was constantly growing, and um, and it, it's people are still buying grass-fed, but they're they're buying imported. And what they don't understand is that that import, for the most part, that imported grass-fed beef is not grown not raised regeneratively so they're not getting the environmental they think they think oh i'm doing the right thing i'm i'm buying grass and beef it's not just good for my health it's good for the environment because of the way it's raised well it, it's it's true that it's not grain but it's not raised, it's not grazed uh you know rotationally or regeneratively so yeah. you don't get the carbon storage. You don't get all these benefits, and that's what people don't know uh, because it's this. The, right, that's the, that's the, the, you know the USA, but but that just means it's minimally processed, packaged in the USA. It's not it's not raised in the USA. So that's another message that needs to get out there. Yeah, that's yeah. the policy. You know, you can. I've gone into grocery stores when I'm selling, and I can take a picture of the whole meat case with six or seven choices of grass fed beef. All these different companies and all of it is from elsewhere and it all says 
product USA on it. Because the law is that if you bring a container load of beef into the port of Boston, bring it to a processing plan and some mass and you grind it up, completely illegal to write on it, product of USA. I mean, and it's just outrageous. And the consumer has no clue. I mean, the consumer is trying to do the right thing. Oh, grass fed. Oh, great. We got some choices here. But in reality, <clears throat> you know, none of it's uh, from the USA. And not none of it is necessarily regeneratively grazed. So right. cool. yeah, we're saying we're we're saying that none of it the the, the the meat that's labeled product of the USA almost certainly is not because the domestic producers are not putting product of the USA. On, <laughs> on, so so you ha you have to know um, you know where the company or brand you know transparency is really the the answer at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, I've noticed some in some places, like I was in Florida, and I noticed that there was grass-fed beef marketed as from Florida. Um, yeah. So, so that's helpful. But yeah, it it is a big problem. Um, I am curious. I don't. I I read the book, but I read it quickly, so I may have missed it. I don't know if you mentioned anything about organic prairie. Um, if because I feel like so organic prairie is the um, the meat section of Organic Valley Co-op. Are, are they supporting a lot of grass-fed producers in the United States right now, or has that not come up to scale yet? Not, I, I'm not that I know of. You know, there's a couple of big companies that have embraced grass-fed, Panorama and a couple others. Well, now uh, a lot of companies have embraced, uh, Nyman Ranch just announced last week they're going to have a, a grass-fed uh, program. So it's a sexy thing once, once again. But it's really a question, and a lot of the big companies, what their inclination is, is to <clears throat> take grass-fed cattle and put them on a feedlot and feed them forage. So in other words, the system that's worked for them in the past by doing the finish, you know, creating the fat, by <clears throat> putting the animals together it's, uh, and then bringing the feed to them, a lot of companies are doing that with grass-fed beef so that the animal is essentially, you know, parked in a feedlot and it's they're fed just grass, but they're just they're so stealing. People are trying to game the system. Grass-fed grass, grass fed isn't, the even 100% grass-fed isn't the best name for this product because, oh, and the pasture-raised isn't either because they've also, some companies have tried feeding them even grain in the pasture and they're still calling it pasture. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. No, that's a big one. That's a big one in the, in the Northeast here that wow. well, foods is the big one behind that. So it's pasture raised, but we feed them the grain in the pasture. Yeah. Oh, that is Are you kidding me. It's like, uh, so that's what, what we mean when we say the transparency is, is really important. Uh, well, the, because... smoke and, the smoke and mirrors are, extreme because the consumer has a, enough of an inkling to know that they want this. Right. And so there's all these corporations, well, how can we do it without spending any money? And they just, you know, can we cut this corner? Can we cut that corner? And there is no regulation. So they can cut right. lots of corners and get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. We encourage folks to look for American grass fed certified. Uh, are there other certifiers that, that, our consumer facing. Yeah, yeah they're, they're uh, American Welfare Approved as okay. a grass fest category. Mm -hmm. ECO, the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Certified Organic, has a grass fed standard. They're the ones that certify maple, uh, maple, whatever it is. Uh, oh, maple creamery. Ma maple creamery, yeah. Maple Hill creamery. So there are good standards out there, but they are. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty hard situation. And um, uh, you know, look at what or organic is going through and has yeah. gone through with the, um, you know, so organic is finally people understand that it's important and, and they want their food to be organically raised. So now, you know, there you've got these ridiculous situations where, you know, you've got these gigantic farms, uh, you know, where the, where animals are not even uh, on, on pasture, um, and, you know, technically, you know, they're organic, but the, 
or the hydroponic is another another issue uh, for the for the in terms of the plants um, in terms of the vegetables. But uh, so I bring that up just to, just to point out that um, at this point, you know, it, it's a jungle out there, and uh, the, it's really hard for people to know, uh, uh, you know, what they're what they're buying. And so it's it, it's never been more important to be educated. And, um, uh, but, you know, th things ch change, we all know rapidly and, you know, what's happening with climate change, as I indicated, um, you know, that we're only beginning to see the problem. It's not just, it's not just from flooding where, you know, where you, of course you have human populations on the move and you have fields flooded, but it's not just that it's, it's plants that were grown in, um, for decades in, in or for centuries in, in Italy, say so. You think, well, so maybe they'll be grown in Germany. Well, not necessarily. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors involved, and you're not necessarily going to think, well, just move everything, you know, um, a, a, away from the equator. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. It, it's going to there's going to be a lot of hunger, mm -hmm. and so it's and this, you know, diminishing uh, this. Use of fossil fuels needs to be. Uh, we need to, you know, do that and and be concerned about climate emissions. So all these things are 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 getting to the point where we just can't deny them anymore. People can't deny them, and and so I think that I mean that that works well for for regenerative grazing because it addresses these needs and it it can feed um, it can use ruminant animals to um, process plants um, to provide healthy protein for for populations, many of whom will be displaced by by climate change. So uh, all I'm saying is that there are events totally out of our control that are coming to the forefront rapidly that are going to have an impact, and I think they can't help but um, you, you know. Uh, uh, be important for for, for uh, people learning the potential of of, uh, uh, of aggressive beef and regenerative grazing to address these global as well as local issues. Definitely, yeah. Ultimately, you know, we do a lot of consumer education about how to read labels, but ultimately, you you need a relationship with local farmers, and then you'll learn all of these things in terms of your local economy and your local climate and the struggles that the farmers around you are going through. And that's the way to really get involved. Do you all have any closing thoughts on? Well, well yeah, well, one, one quick thing I wanted to mention just because it's a platform and it's in the book is one of the things we hear all the time when we say grass fed beef, they say, well, what about the methane? Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, thanks The methane question. is just a non-issue if you put the cattle on grass. If you put the cow in a concrete in a university and you put a plastic bag around them, yeah, they're going to generate methane. <laughs> right. so when you put them in a field where you have methanogenic bacteria and the yep. cow's nose is right down there, it becomes uh, it's 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 it's, an, it's not the issue that's been built up to be and. Uh, it's a big one because people are trying to do the, you know, do the right thing. And, you know, <clears throat> I think it is important for people to understand in a pasture, there's two oxidation zones um, where the methane is, is uh, neutralized. Uh, one is, uh, you know, at the soil line by the uh, methanotrophic bacteria that Ridge mentioned. And there's another oxidation zone that happens where the water is, is transpired from the plant. And so, um, and, and and see that that's an example of what you know climate activists do need to understand these issues and I guess that's that's the thing that I want to leave with the people that should be most excited about this and promoting it are the environmentalists and particularly the climate activists but there's but they have learned well the the um, the problems with conventional beef production and they do not understand yet, most of them don't, that these things do not apply to, to regeneratively grazed ruminants. In fact, regenerative grazing addresses these problems. And but it's hard to get people to listen. They're so used to, you know, it's a, it's 
that they're so used to thinking, uh, uh, you know, beef is bad and, and particularly bad for the environment. And it, it, it's a tough, it's a, it's clearly it's not a soundbite. It's taken us, so, you know, uh, almost an hour and a half to say all this. And, uh, uh, you know, pe people don't have the message, but the climate activists need to take the time to understand this. And this is why we put, you know, as much science as we did in the in the book so that people and, and the, you know, the references, people understand this is peer reviewed science. Um, and uh, so once the once the environmentalists r realize that um, that this is a solution, this is a critically uh, not the only solution, but it's an important climate strategy, then you know, we'll have that whole cohort of people who understand it and, and who can, um, you know, make things happen in terms of public policy and in terms of, you know, land use planning and um, so forth and so on. Definitely. Well, I encourage everyone to, to reach out to their local farmers and buy direct and use the regenerative farm map at regenerationinternational.org to connect with local farmers. And so I've been talking with Lynn Pledger and Rid Shin. They're the authors of the book, Grass-Fed Beef for a Post-Pandemic World. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I encourage everyone to read this book. They're, it's, it's the latest book, but it's also, I think, a synthesis of a lot of the information that has come before it. It's very timely, really well-researched, and covers all the ground that we've talked about, but, you know, lots and lots of resources in there. It's, it's a great entry point, I think, for both consumers and for people who are thinking about getting into the business. So thank you so much for this excellent book. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Alexis Badenmayer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. And today I have the great pleasure of being joined by Ronnie Cummins. He's the international director of the Organic Consumers Association and he's one of the founders of Regeneration International. And we're here with Ben Dobson. Ben Dobson is with Hudson Carbon. And um, as you can see, he's on a farm around <laughs> near the Hudson River. And what Ben works on is finding ways to compensate or, or reward financially farmers for the ecosystem services that they provide. And Ben and Ronnie are working on a project at Via Organica in Mexico on, on how to get farmers into a, a very cool agroforestry project for hot, dry climates. And so I'll let Ronnie and Ben take it away. So Ben, you wanna get us started? I'd love to. Uh, I'm, my name is Ben Dobson. I'm a farmer from the Hudson Valley uh, and straddled the border of the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts for most of my life with a foray into Maine and another into the Caribbean, working with uh, tropical agriculture for a few years in the 2000s. Um, what brought me to this work was finding, um, was realizing that no one pays enough for food and rightfully so. They don't have a whole lot of extra money to pay for good food. But to produce good food, farmers really need to find a new way to be compensated. Uh, and in these complicated times, um, we, we are, it's more important than ever that we find new revenue streams for farmers who are growing good food and that we make sure that people who need good food can get it. So about uh, six, seven years ago, we started Hudson Carbon, really thinking that carbon credits may be the right way forwards. Uh, and in some ways, we believe that uh, carbon credits are, but really we're, we're much more following a, a holistic pathway to looking at whole ecosystem services provided by healthy food. And also really assessing, well, healthy food makes healthy people, and that's really valuable as well. And we're right in the midst of um, finalizing our measurement methodologies and now really building out a financial model for what do eco credits look like, ecosystem service credits paid to farmers who treat their environment right? You know, unfortunately, the, the greenwashing and the, the so-called carbon uh, trading on the international scale uh, have discredited this whole idea that you can help solve the climate crisis with food and farming. So uh, one of the 
one of the things is that the prices that have been paid uh, for this greenwashing are very low to farmers. And uh, what what's your what's your belief about the carbon uh, eco credit system? Uh, the level of, of money that farmers should be getting for this. Sure, I'd, I'd like to respond first a little to what you just brought up, which is that the greenwashers have just almost achieved a coup. Um, they have who they want in the USDA. They've had who they've wanted in the White House for quite some time. Um, and what's recently happened is they're now calling corn and soy climate smart commodities. I think that early on, Ronnie, your, your movement you and I are part of, uh, put a little fear into the hearts of, uh, of the big agricultural conglomerates who are the leading polluters and of our bodies and our planet. I'm talking Cargill. I'm talking Monsanto, ADM. Hey, guys. Um, they are now you know, purporting to be involved in regenerative agriculture. And they're do they've stacked the system with pretty bad measurement methodologies that don't look at the whole picture. And they're just touting no-till with a lot of chemicals and a few cover crops as a solution to climate change. And they're signing farmers on for really low paying carbon credits. And they're selling those credits to other polluters like oil companies and airlines. And it's all hunky dory for them. The problem is the planet's still going to shit faster than ever. So we really need to look at uh, real measurement as opposed to written methodologies where paper pushers can create carbon credits for the wrong type of agriculture and the wrong type of supply chain. So our measurement focus at Hudson Carbon for seven years has been seven years and we're finally coming to a close where we're looking at carbon in the context of water, and biodiversity, in chemical free natural farms. And really we look at these as ecological or eco credits. Um, and right now, the real focus is finding the right buyers and partnering with the right certifiers. But we really feel that it's time to now deploy with the right farm organization, such as yourselves. And uh, we're inspired by groups like the Real Organic Project and others who are bringing truth to the table so that the farmers who are growing real food in a really, truly ecological, bene ecologically beneficial manner can collect eco credits. And we feel that there, uh, we know there are a lot of people ready to pay for these. Um, the most important challenge right now is getting some governmental bodies, local, state, it won't be the federal government, but local and state governments to say, hey, these credits are legitimate, legitimate and they're helping us to achieve our local, regional, and state level climate goals. Yes. Well, we're having a little bit of luck in Mexico with the federal government, uh, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, yeah, what about this whole idea that the, uh, you know, the, the climate crisis is just a creation of the World Economic Forum and Bill Gates and them to seize control uh, over uh, governmental power in every country of the world? I mean, it seems like they, they're, they're starting to discredit the whole idea of climate action if we don't step out, you know, more forcefully. Yeah, the... Climate action is they're trying to put this to sleep because climate action, true climate action, true food action and true health are antithetical to the goals of the World Economic Forum and the oligarchs who have really taken over this planet. Um, I, I truly believe and I see the progress you guys are making in Mexico because you have a government that uh, doesn't want to work for Uncle Sam. And when we really look at the root of this problem, it's our global economic system. And I said that the World Economic Forum and Bill Gates and them have, have seemingly tried to discredit the whole idea of food and farming as part of legitimate climate action and just want to greenwash. Uh, what do you think about that? What's the future of organic and regenerative farming and food in terms of solving uh, or being part of the solution to the climate crisis? I think this is the question of our lives and our times right now, is we live in a, in a country and a world that has really achieved this globalist vision of, of American capitalism. And Henry Kissinger said it himself. He said, they who control the food supply control nations. Those who control the energy supply control continents. Those who supply money supply control the world. That really sums up what America's done here. And we have the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and a couple banks, the World Bank and the IMF, to back it up. 
And we've now spent 50 years systematically destroying food production systems at the local, state, and national level, not just in our country, but all across the world. And we now see the climate crisis as something we want to manage and control using GMO agriculture. And what does that do? It brings up the scale of agriculture and removes people from their communities, removes people from the, and removes the culture from agriculture. Now it becomes ag. And we're really in a dangerous place where the future of the organic and regenerative movement is the only way we are going to feed ourselves with sovereignty at the local, regional levels. And it's the most important way where countries can unchain themselves from the United States. I have friends from all around the world and many of these countries are now dependent on American food supply and they're starving. Talk to people in Jamaica. They, don't, they have all this empty land. They don't make their own food. They depend on American imports. Talk to people in Haiti, they're starving. Mexico is importing our corn. So our local and regenerative movement is the only way and we have to rebuild it. We have to overcome the depression that is coming to people like me at this time. And we really have to band together and find a way to rebuild this and make sure that eaters know what they're eating and that they're in buying food from the right farms, they're supporting their own freedom and the potential for culture to come back into agriculture. And uh, the we're gonna have later in the program in Australia, a group called the Organic and Regenerative Investment Co-op. Uh, and it's interesting that they're starting down this road of saying that the, the floor or the bottom line for uh, eco credits should be that you're you're farming organically, uh, you're farming regeneratively, and then let's quantify all the benefits uh, on top of that uh, that this this farm or this region is is doing, and let's force the polluters to pay the farmers uh, to carry out uh, you know scale up these best practices. I think that's just the way we need to go. Um, first off. You know, everyone's talking about how do we quantify biodiversity? That's difficult. But one thing we do know is that farms who aren't spraying herbicides and pesticides designed to kill everything are certainly a lot more biodiverse. So I think certified organic farms should and organic refers to carbon. When when the word came into agriculture, it was the original carbon farming. The word regenerative is good, but it's already been hijacked. So I like to use regenerative as, as an adjective regenerative organic. That's what I like to talk about. Exactly. And I think that I'm so happy you're talking to the group in Australia. We really need that model to come over here to the States. And we have some beacons here, like the Real Organic Project. Of course, you guys with the OCA, we all need to band together to bring real carbon credits with real money and to call them ecological credits to certified organic producers. And I'm talking about organic big O, like organic for carbon, but also no chemicals. And that's what we need to move towards. I'm really happy you're bringing them on. And uh, how would this work in practice if a farm uh, in the United States, as hundreds are now, uh, had gotten certified as, as the, under the Real Organic Project? Uh, they would be able to, who gets, who will uh, put up the money, who will make sure what the division is between the farmer and the people who help out. How would that work in practice, these uh, organic eco credits? So we've been really mapping this out. Um, and just in full disclosure, I, I would love it if the Real Organic Project were fully participating, but we need to talk to them. Our goal here at Hudson Carbon is to bring our methodology to organic certifiers. So that when organic certifier certifies your farm organic, we can partner with them to make sure that measurements are a few additional measurements are made and verification so that eco or eco carbon credits can be added on. To make those valuable, we need buyers. And there are some willing polluters who want to do the right thing. And more importantly, there are states such as New York State, actually, we have the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And we're fighting hard for the forestry and farming provisions of the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, to pay farmers who are using truly good practices. NOFA New York is interested in seeing the right thing happen, and we really feel that it's all about, we now need to get around this greenwashing by putting organic certifiers in combination with real folks measuring carbon and ecological impact on organic farms to the forefront of the paid carbon, paid ecosystem service discussion. And that needs to be done at the local and state level. 
I don't think the U.S. government is on board at this point. They're too corrupt. They need to be forced by seeing states go the way they go. And there are some big food buyers who, are, who know that they won't have a food supply if they don't have a climate we can live in. So we're looking to a lot of the middle players and, and some of the players in the food, sellers of food, such as food co-ops, um, natural food stores. These have always been the place where we go get our natural food and we feel this will start to be the place where we start having our local and regional climate discussion. Um, so it's going to be a mix of polluters and also people paying for these extra carbon credits so that you know we the people take climate into our own hands and hopefully the government will follow well good well we look forward to uh, continuing this discussion uh, uh, over the next few months and and uh, pointing out that there are literally millions of farmers uh, around the world and and herds people pastoralists who are uh, practicing their farming in an organic and regenerative way and there's a way to identify them to help them quantify uh, their farming practices, and then to get the money in their hands they need to scale up what they're doing. And we look forward to working Hudson Carbon, Regeneration International, uh, V Organica, all the all the global uh, affiliates uh, to advance this program because the current system of carbon credits and carbon trading and corporate greenwashing are not working. Obviously, emissions are going up, not down. And people are starting to question whether we can turn things around. And that's our job at Regeneration International and farmers like Ben, uh, organizers, projects like Hudson Carbon. We are certain that we can solve this problem because we see that it's being solved at the local level in many, many areas of the world. And the next step up is to set up our own eco-credit certification system and uh, get this money flowing into the right hand, make the changes we need. So uh, thanks a lot, Ben, for all you're doing. And we look forward to uh, meeting with you in person here in a, in a couple of weeks uh, at the meetings we're having in Mexico. Thank you, Ronnie. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And I look forward to putting together our framework for these next steps. It's an exciting time. All righty. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Alexis Bademeyer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. I'm here with Ronnie Cummins. He is our international director and also one of the founders of Regeneration International. So happy World Food Day, everybody. We're continuing with our broadcast. And this is part two of the conversation we started with Ben Dobson of Hudson Carbon. Ronnie talked to Ben Dobson about carbon credits about the politics around carbon credits, the justification for paying farmers to restore the landscape through regenerative, rege regenerative organic agriculture. And they talked about some of the, the pros and cons of the whole carbon market world. So we're not going to, to go into that. If you're interested in those subjects, go back to our interview with Ben Dobson. But in this conversation, Ronnie, I'd like to talk to you about a great example of a project that really does deserve carbon credits. And I'd like you to tell us about the Billion Agave Project, um, how it functions as a regenerative agriculture system, but also about how this project would be good for a carbon credit system and how that would work and, and what it would enable in terms of bringing this regenerative agriculture project to to all of the places in the world where it would work. Well, thank you very much, Alexis. The role of Regeneration International the last couple of years has been to search the world for what we consider best practices and game-changing best practices of organic and regenerative agriculture. Now, what do we mean by this? Uh, well, we mean practices around the world like people in Brazil restoring uh, degraded rainforests or, or deforested rainforests and bringing it back to full, uh, you know, the, the full carbon sequestration and, and environmental services that it was before it was deforested. Or what we discovered a little over three years ago in Mexico is a system, uh, the agave agroforestry system. Uh, and basically, we believe this is one of the 
the major game changers around the world. Uh, why do we say this? Okay, uh, 40 percent of the world's lands are what people say call semi-arid or arid. Well, what do they mean by that? Well, it means that they're they're not quite desert yet, but they're getting there quickly. They're typically not capable of supporting uh, crops uh, any longer. Uh, if they're grazing animals on it, they've been overgrazed. Typically, the the farmers and herds people uh, who are working these lands uh, don't have wells and they're not going to get uh, irrigation. Uh, it's extremely difficult to carry out reforestation in these areas because there's there's usually limited rainfall. It's usually just part of the year in the rainy season. You have like where we are in Mexico, eight to nine months where there's no rain whatsoever. So it's very challenging to grow crops. Uh, it's very challenging not to overgraze, and it's very challenging not to uh, or to be able to reforest these areas. Uh, and so that's why when you look at the worlds, the 40% of the world that are arid or semi-arid, uh, this is closely correlates to the 40% of the world where the poorest people live. It correlates to where there's the most extreme forms of forced migration where people, especially young people, are leaving their home communities and trying to make their way to big cities or to Europe or North America where they can make a decent living or survive. Uh, it's also the areas where there's typically the most uh, violence or civil strife, where drug gangs are roaming, where there's, a, you know, essentially uh, civil war, you know, going on. So uh, any system uh, that we can find uh, that's organic and regenerative uh, that could work in this, this uh, part of the world, the 40 percent that's arid or semi-arid, would be a big deal. Uh, and so lots of people have tried in these areas uh, to make things better. Uh, but a little over three years ago, we visited a farm in Mexico about 45 minutes from our organic research farm. Uh, and we we saw something we had never seen before, something we'd never read before in the literature that was quite amazing. And this was the growing of agaves, which are a common plant uh, in semi-desert uh, areas. A uh, large plant, you've probably seen pictures of them if you haven't seen them in the uh, in the U.S. Southwest uh, or other places uh, that are used to grow. Uh, they use the uh, root stock or the, it looks like a pineapple for tequila, to make tequila or to make mezcal. But that's typically all people uh, have heard about with these plants. Well, what these small farmers in north central Mexico discovered was that the half of the biomass of these plants, you know, the plants can weigh as much as a ton, uh, you know, after 10 years when they're mature, but at least half of that biomass, if not more, are the leaves of the plant. They're in Spanish, they're called pancos. Uh, and these leaves had always just been considered uh, a useless part of the plant, uh, partly, uh, well, in large part, because they're indigestible to animals uh, or humans. Uh, no one had ever produced a... Uh, uh, anything of, of great value from these plants. I mean, there's some secondary uses, wrapping uh, barbecue or, or barbacoa in these plants for flavor and a few things. Anyway, what this uh, what these farmers discovered was the uh, if you chop up the leaves of these plants, you can prune them progressively from when they're three years old all the way to maturity at around 10, 10 12 years, our varieties. Uh, you chop off these leaves, you chop them up finely, you put them in a closed container and ferment them. You don't add anything else. The plant uh, leaves will ferment into a, a digestible and, in fact, uh, nutritious and healthy uh, animal food supplement. Now, this is basically like discovering a massive new food source that never one knew, no one knew was there before. Uh, in areas where there's a tremendous scarcity 
of grass where there's a tremendous scarcity of food for the animals, uh, where the, uh, the people are basically right on the verge of giving up farming and raising their animals because they can't survive anymore. They can't afford to buy food to feed their animals during the dry season. The animals are typically uh, scrawny and not very healthy uh, during the dry season. And the land just keeps getting further and further degraded. Yes, governments have reforestation programs around the world in these type of in this type of terrain, uh, but none of these, uh, uh, with a few exceptions, have been successful. So, so what we saw when we first visited this farm uh, was that they had combined the tree cover of the native tree cover of a mesquite tree uh, and the agave in a densely planted uh, agroforestry system where they had 2,000 of these agave plants, which get quite large over time, uh, with uh, 400 or so mesquite trees. Now, what's the importance of this? Well, the importance of this is that a monoculture of just agave uh, it, yeah, it's going to look good, it's going to grow fast, but it's going to deplete the soils because the agave plants growing so large, so rapidly, uh, they need nitrogen and they need nutrients from the soil. Uh, so just the same way that corn, beans, and squash in combination, or what's called a milpa uh, in uh, Mexico, uh, keeps the soil nourished the beans put the nitrogen in the soil that the corn pulls out. The, uh, the squash uh, smothers the, the uh, uh, weeds that would uh, slow down the growth, retard the growth. That mixture of those three combos uh, kept things in balance. Well, this mixture does too. Uh, the amazing thing about agaves um, are that they're growing in 20% of the world's lands right now. Uh, they don't grow where it's really cold, but they grow in these uh, desert and arid, semi-arid areas. Well, why is that uh, if, they, if they started in Mexico, in Mesoamerica? How come they're all over the world? How come you find these agaves in India and in China and in, in uh, Southern Africa, uh, even in uh, Oman, some of the Middle Eastern uh, countries? Uh, well, it's it's pretty simple. It's because the colonial powers, Britain, Spain, Portugal, brought agave plants from Mexico to their colonies around the world, uh, starting about 200 years ago, because they were the main source henequen, uh, they called it the the fiber from a variety of the agave was the main source for rope. It was the main source for bags that people use to carry things, you know, for, uh, you know, ship sails and, uh, and you know, clothing and it had enormous uh, potential. The fibers of this plant are really strong. Uh, but then you have the development of modern cotton processing equipment uh, starting, you know, a little over 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, later, the discovery of synthetic plastics that really made uh, Henneken uh, obsolete. So you don't you don't see, you know, Henneken rope. I mean, there is some, you can find it, but you don't see Henneken rope and garments and, and other uh, production before. So, uh, but in the meantime, the colonial powers had, had taken these plants all over the world and not just the variety that produces Henneken, but other varieties as well. So today, they're out there growing wild. In most cases, they're not being utilized for anything. Uh, but you also find something else, and this is Mother Nature's invention, not ours, is whenever you have a land that's moving from grassland or savanna into desert, uh, being desertified, uh, Mother Nature tends to put out trees uh, that uh, put nitrogen in the soil hold the soil from erosion, and they also they, they put out bean pods. Uh, and these are called acacias, uh, and mesquite is one of these. But acacias grow 
in these 40 in the 40 percent of the world that's arid and semi-arid uh, and we're often a, in the same area as the agave so it's these are native trees and a native plant a native desert succulent a giant native succulent that are compatible together that can grow together uh, and the amazing thing is they don't need any irrigation uh, the the trees need a little bit when they first get going uh, we tend to transplant them at the beginning of the rainy season so they get a little moisture. Uh, the characteristic of these trees that you find in these arid, semi-arid areas are that they don't look that uh, impressive, usually above the ground. They grow very slowly above the ground. Uh, but what's amazing that people didn't realize for a long time, they have enormous roots, like a mesquite. Uh, a mature mesquite tree can go down 125 feet, the roots. Uh, they are a, a keystone species. They're the home for the mycorrhizal fungi that is like the, the internet of the, of the ground, you know, in the area. They are an amazing tree. Uh, and, you know, where I grew up in Texas, mesquite were considered uh, a nuisance because they have these big thorns on them, cattle you know, uh, get stuck by these thorns. You get stuck by these thorns. Uh, they're not very big. Yeah, when they get older, 50, 100 years old, the wood is really hard, really good, really valued. But we never understood. Yeah, ranchers notice that the uh, animals really like the be the pods of the mesquite uh, that come out a couple of months a year. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're good feed for the animals when there's uh, not much else out there during that time of year. But that's about it. But here we're looking at a game changer. Our system of a couple of thousand uh, mesquites, uh, excuse me, a couple of thousand agaves interspersed with, say, 400 uh, nitrogen-fixing mesquite trees or acacias can uh, sequester 140 tons of CO2 uh, per hectare, or, you know, about uh, uh, 50, 50 tons per acre uh, on an extended basis after 10 years. So it'll, it will continue to sequester that above ground. The trees will, you know, many of these uh, acacias can live for 100 years or more. So we're looking at a product that uh, is sorely needed, which is uh, animal feed supplements. Uh, we're looking at something like when we combine mesquite flour, which is high in protein, with the uh, fermented agave, we end up with something better than, uh, than uh, alfalfa, uh, certainly better than, than corn for uh, herbivores, for grass-eating uh, animals but it costs very little to produce. It takes no irrigation. It's already growing uh, out there and it's growing in the areas of the world where people most desperately need uh, a livelihood. They need hope that they can stay on the land and survive. You know, a lot of these people, uh, they have no bank account. Their bank account are their animals. You know, when they, when they have a medical emergency or they have you know, someone's getting married or first communion or a birthday party, uh, they sell their animals. Uh, and if we can uh, help them uh, have healthier animals, if we can help them uh, start to stop overgrazing their, in the case of Mexico, their communal lands, which are the majority of the lands of Mexico, uh, if we can get them to see that, oh, here you have an agricultural system that is inherently organic. You don't need any chemical fertilizers. You don't need any pesticides. You don't need any, uh, you know, hormones and, you know, uh, extra drug feed supplements for, for healthy animals. Uh, we've got a game changer. So this is, this is the type. We believe there's about 10 types of agricultural production in the world today uh, that meet these criteria of being organic, regenerative, and having the real potential to be scaled up on a massive scale. Uh, to give you an idea, in Mexico, for example, Mexico is one of the top 10 producers of greenhouse gases in the world. 
because they have a lot of petroleum. They have a lot of people, 120, 30 million people. They have a lot of large cities, cars, you know, all the, you know, all the problems of modern industrial society. The, the uh, feedlots are, are there. They're not as quite as uh, large a percentage as in the U.S., but there's a lot of chemical fertilizer being used. There's a lot of uh, soil erosion. There's there's tremendous problems, uh, you know, in the environment. And uh, the if with six billion agaves planted, uh, and uh, you know a billion or so uh, nitrogen fixing trees, appropriate trees for each area, uh, we would literally be able to uh, sequester uh, above ground and below ground. Uh, all the emissions that Mexico is now emitting, okay? I mean, in one state alone in Mexico, there's 32 states in Mexico, uh, in one state called Jalisco, that's where the city of Guadalajara is located. It's the, it's the world center for producing tequila. Well, they have half a billion uh, agave plants in that one state alone. Uh, there's, you know, there's another uh, billion or so agaves growing the pro uh, wild in various parts of Mexico. Uh, the problem is that these are growing in a monoculture. They're not part of an agroforestry system. They're, they're monoculture systems where they're using chemical fertilizers. They're, you know, they're throwing away uh, the leaves of the plant. They're throwing away the leftover fiber after they've extracted the liquid. Uh, if you look at this holistically and we decide, oh my God, uh, let's use 100% of the plant. Let's not have any waste. Uh, let's plant these trees uh, or let's plant these agaves where there's already tree, tree cover uh, that where they'll flourish or let's plant the agaves and the trees together. If you're working with land that's been cleared for pasture, uh, or if you're you're uh, working on land that's been uh, cleared for a monoculture type agriculture, and we are extremely excited about this. Uh, we have uh, our our research farm outside of San Miguel. We've got fifty thousand agaves uh, growing. We've got about fifteen hundred uh, mesquite and other trees as as companion trees growing. Uh, we've got a conference center there. So right now we're bringing. Uh, farmers from all over Mexico to see what we're doing. Uh, we sleep some of the people overnight. We've got an organic restaurant and store there so we can really give people the, the green carpet treatment. These, uh, these low-income farmers who have never seen anything like uh, the beauty of an organic farm the, uh, and this system. And then they say, oh my goodness, look at, look at these animals, these sheep and goats and chickens and pigs that are eating what we thought was garbage, you know, the uh, leaves of the plant, uh, and they're thriving. Uh, and this whole ranch is organic, and they can get a good price for their uh, animal products uh, because they don't use any chemicals. And we don't even have a well. Uh, we, use, we use the water that we capture during the three- to four-month rainy season. We also capture the uh, rainfall as it... Uh, as it uh, flows off the, we're in a mountain valley, uh, we capture that in ponds and cisterns. So we we see, and now we've gotten the Mexican government, uh, which is the Morena government, most people in the U.S. don't know this, or Canada, but the Morena government is kind of like, what if Bernie Sanders were the president of the United States? You know, and you had someone who had spoken out against GMOs and Monsanto, you know, and spoken uh, in the interest of small farmers for decades, what if you had them in the in the White House or you had them in Ottawa? Uh, and some of the activists that we've worked with for 20 years in Mexico uh, against Monsanto, who helped us achieve a situation where GMO corn uh, is banned to be grown in Mexico. GMO soybeans are banned to be grown in Mexico. The government says they want to stop importing the 18 million tons of uh, GMO yellow corn that is brought in from the U.S. every year for animal feed. The government has announced that they want agroecology, uh, which is the name in Latin America for organic, to be the norm. 
Uh, well, that's the situation we have. So we're now excited that we have the federal government, we have the mayor of Mexico City uh, interested in this system. We've got farm groups all over the country, including indigenous communities, co-ops, uh, organic certifiers. And we believe this is going to be uh, a billion dollar uh, enterprise for small and medium farmers that's going to develop utilizing plants that are that are native, that are right there. And uh, with Regeneration International, we do have some staff overseas in places like Zimbabwe, in Southern Africa, uh, in Miramar, in, in Asia, uh, in Australia, and we're getting inquiries from all over the world. Okay, where are we going to get the money to help these deploy this system? Well, we believe that, uh, like Ben Dobson pointed out, uh, there can be a new stage of carbon credits that's not greenwashing, that's not just enriching uh, uh, people who already have a lot of money, but that could actually pay farmers to do what they're doing to improve the environment, to, to use less water, to create a situation where more rainwater penetrates into the soil, where the soil fertility comes back, you know, where you produce on unproductive land or land that's very difficult, uh, the food for your animals, the food for yourself, uh, where, yes, you still can produce these products for the market like mezcal or tequila or inulin, which is a very valuable uh, nutritional supplement that also comes from this plant. But basically where we can help local people, there's a million local communities across the world where there's some far farming or gardening. We need to help these people according to each situation, rediscover what's already out there, the best practices of their neighbors. And this is one that is going to have a major impact, not only in Mexico and Central America, uh, but also in the southwestern U.S., where farming is becoming increasingly difficult, where water is increasingly scarce, where livestock can barely survive, uh, and where farmers uh, are starting to wonder if they can make it anymore. So we're looking forward to this year. Uh, now that we've proved the concept in Mexico, now that we have people all over the country starting to adopt this, uh, we want to uh, bring this system to other appropriate areas. Uh, you know, the Arizona's got millions of, of mesquite trees. Texas has 54 million acres of mesquite trees. They don't have the agaves uh, except as ornamental plants. Uh, you know, for the most part, but they will grow in these areas. California now is talking about, oh, we need to develop a uh, California distilled spirits or mezcal industry. Uh, the Imperial Valley, the whole uh, agribusiness area of California can no longer function overusing water and growing, growing plants like alfalfa and almonds that there's simply not enough water. This system is going to be one of the systems that takes over. So we invite you to go to the website of Regeneration International, subscribe to our free newsletter, look at, at the, the systems that we're talking about around the world, that we don't need to reinvent uh, these systems that are already there. What we need to do is figure out a way that we can support the farmers and herds people, pastoralists, ranchers who are... Uh, Deploying these systems, uh, do so, and uh, this will be something that, you know, like I lay out my book, Grassroots Rising, yes, we got to move to alternative energy, we got to conserve energy, but we also have to make organic and regenerative farming and land using the norm. We got to plant a trillion trees, we have to work with the half a million small farms, half a billion small farms around the world, and create a regenerative uh, future that's based on, uh, you know, agroecology, organics, and uh, healthy food, healthy animals. So there you have it, the Billion Agave Project. Look that up. Uh, check out the articles we've written. Uh, go to our website. Uh, there's links from organicconsumers.org. There's links at regenerationinternational.org. And in Spanish, viorganica.org. 
Well, thank you so much, Ronnie. That's excellent. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for watching. To see the next clip, please go to facebook.com slash regeneration international slash live.